Hello everyone, it's Jane Clifton here. I hope that I'm on air at this point in time. Um, if we're not, we'll soon find out. But by my watch, it's 6.30, so welcome. Um, I'm going to be spending an hour with you tonight. Uh, normally we'd be in the library together and uh, I could see all your faces, but um, I'm hoping you can see mine. Uh, and um, I think we'll have a lovely chat. I have a something with me and I hope you have too. Usually we have to wait until after the talk. Let me begin by um, acknowledge acknowledging on behalf of the Glenara Council that we acknowledge the Boon people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which Glenara resides. Now, because I'm coming to you from Maribyrnong on the banks of the mighty Blood River, we also acknowledge the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nation. We pay their, our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. So, um, I suppose uh, you, some of you might know me from a whole lot of different areas as an actor or a singer or a writer, hopefully, um, but I never make assumptions about what people know about me. Uh, so, uh, because I, I always have that moment where someone will come up to me, nearly every day of my life, someone will come up to me and say, I know you. And I will say to them, oh yes, well, you might know me from some play or from something and they'll go, Oh, no, I think I went to school with you. So then it's too late and you've got to explain what it is and it all gets very embarrassing. So I don't make any assumptions about what you know about me. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my past uh, and what's brought me to this point some decades later and talk about um, different aspects of myself as a performer and primarily as a writer and, um, and as a reader, because I know that all of you uh, probably use your library and love to read and love to know about what makes, um, what, what it takes to become a writer and how you go about it. So I'll start at the beginning. I was born on the Rock of Gibraltar. Anyone here born on the Rock of Gibraltar? I can ask that question quite safely because uh, I've only ever met two people in Australia who were from Gibraltar and um, one was a taxi driver in Sydney who made me wish I'd never mentioned it and uh, the other was my optometrist. But um, no, I was born on the Rock of Gibraltar because my father was a soldier. He was a regular soldier in the British Army, which meant that I had a childhood where we travelled around a lot, myself and my um Myself and my three sisters, my elder sister and two younger sisters, we moved about all over the place. My elder sister was born in Karachi. I was born in Gibraltar. My next sister was born in Germany and my youngest sister was born in Malaya. So when we applied to uh, migrate to Australia, they wanted a very good look at us. Uh, so it was a very interesting upbringing, um, living all over the place and, uh, and in some ways um, a great preparation for what became my job. So uh, it's like a first night and a closing night. You're always moving into a new town, meeting new people, wanting everyone to like you, then you're saying goodbye a few weeks later. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really, uh, you know, you're moving around all the time. By the time I got to Australia, I'd been to seven primary schools and three high schools in as many countries and towns. Uh, so in some ways, um, quite a, a strange childhood, but because I was in this British Army system, it was not strange at all because we were all the same. We all lived in the same way. We were all leaving one town and moving on to another. Um, so I didn't feel like a very odd person until I came to Australia. <laughs> I was 12 by the time I came to Australia and we lived in Perth first. Uh, and in 1962, Perth was, um, you know, very different to places we'd lived in before and it was a big adjustment. My father had left the army by then. He was in, he was in business um, and I learned very quickly. I got rid of my English accent very fast because no one wants to hear a 
posh accent in Australia. And I learned not to talk about how I'd been in Germany last week or in England or whatever. So I just shut up about all that and get on with it. Um, we lived in Perth for about three and a half years uh, and I loved it. It was beautiful. I loved the beaches. I was a real surfy, worthy chick. And uh, I thought we were going to live there forever because three and a half years was the longest I'd lived in any town. And uh, it was my teenage years, so it was really crucial. Uh, but then overnight, my dad got um, uh, promoted in his work and we drove across the Nullarbor to Melbourne and I've been here ever since. That was about 1965. So I'd had that kind of really rich cultural upbringing and then came to Melbourne, away from the beach, stopped being a surfy worthy The closest beach was 75 miles away and uh, it was, I mean, surf beach. It was difficult. Um, uh, at the time, I suppose in the 60s, um, the grooviest place in Melbourne, the grooviest place in Australia, I thought, was Monash University and I was determined to go there. I uh, would do anything to get there because um, there, were, there was a show on television called Commotion. You may remember it. It was sort of very groovy fashionistas and dancers miming to the latest rock and roll tracks and quite a lot of them went to Monash. So I was determined to go there, determined to do anything, even study. And I promised my parents that I was going there to become an English teacher. And, you know, in hindsight, I should have become an English teacher. I should have had that in my, you know, my something to fall back on. But um, I got distracted while I was at Monash. I joined the Monash players and got involved in theatre and made them move little by little to Carlton, to La Mama Theatre and the Pram Factory and alternative rock and roll bands. Um, I suppose it was in my DNA because my mother was an actress and a singer as well. So I grew up with that idea of show business in a way in my life. It wasn't foreign to me. Um, but I did, no one ever thought that was going to be your career back then. It was just, you know, the industry was so small. I mean, it still is in a lot of ways. The opportunities are very limited. But the only place you could go and study that sort of thing was in Sydney at NIDA. Uh, National Institute of Dramatic Art, and out of 3,000 applicants, they'd take 60 the first year and whittle it down. So I wasn't about to be able to go and study it. There was no Victorian College of the Arts. There was, um, it was limited. So I suppose like everybody else who started out at, at, in a similar time around Carlton and uh, Fitzroy in alternative theatre, um, we were just doing it because we liked it. It was fun. We, we'd all done street theatre in the moratoriums against the Vietnam War. We'd, um, it was a very exciting time in Australian theatre where um, probably for the first time, apart from, um, you know, uh, Summer of the 17th Doll and One Day of the Year, uh, there were very few plays being performed in Australia that were about us with Australian accents, you know, places like the Melbourne Theatre Company and probably the Sydney Theatre Company did well-made plays from, from Britain and from America and everyone spoke with those accents, but very few people were talking about stuff about us. Uh, so at La Mama, it was a real um, melting pot and um, a fantastic place where new playwrights like John Romerall and Jack Hibbert and Alex Buzo um, were writing plays about us that went on to be, you know, some of them went on to be films uh, like Stork, uh, The Removalists, and um, David Williamson was writing at the time. Uh, many marvellous plays. So it was a great time to be part of that uh, emerging uh, cultural movement. So I was very lucky. Uh, so with, and not a lot of us had training um, and we just went into those shows. And the Australian performing group that began at La Mama then moved around the corner to the Pram Factory and continued that sort of work, that exciting work. And at the same time, uh, within television, there was, of course, the marvellous Crawford Television Productions. Uh, Hector Crawford, who changed the shape of television in, in Australia by 
creating shows like Homicide and Division 4 and um, giving jobs to local actors. I mean, they were all cop shows, but we all got jobs. Uh, it was much easier in those days to go and uh, audition for a role. You'd go and do a general audition um, and then you'd be put on a little card and a little filing service and they would cast you. And strangely, I always seem to get cast as criminals and prostitutes. Don't know something about the way I looked. Anyway, it was work and I was happy to get it. So very exciting times um, in theatre and in television uh, and also in rock and roll. There were a lot of um, tremendous bands around. Um, I, you know, I've been singing rock and roll since um, my high school in Burwood. And uh, always wanted to go and 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 sing, and didn't have uh, you know didn't have a light bulb moment of wanting to be the lead singer. I just wanted to sing, be an et, you know, a lip et or a rock et or whatever. But little by little, I got more involved in music in that way, um, and you know feminism and rock and roll were coming together in many ways um small ways uh we had to struggle but i was in a, a fantastic band called stiletto that um was formed by three women and two men and we you know had a long three years together we were on countdown we had singles and we performed a lot of songs that were about women and uh, women's place in society and were kind of looked upon as a sort of seminal rock and roll band. So, again, I got very lucky with all of that. Um, I did have, I suppose, of all the things that I've done in my career, the, the thing that I'm most well known for um, is, of course, Prisoner. Um, you know, as I often say, I could win an Oscar tomorrow. It's still technically possible. I could win a Grammy, but it wouldn't matter. People would always remember as Margot Gaffney from Prisoner from 40 years ago in the show. And I don't mind that. Again, that was seminal television. That was really, uh, wasn't Crawford's this time. It was Reg Grundy. Um, and it was an extraordinary show in a lot of ways. It was glamorous. It was not. Uh, was nearly all female. Uh, the ratio was probably 75, 25, maybe 80, 20 on screen. And almost every actress in Australia got a Guernsey on, um, on Prisoner. And I was lucky enough to be in it on and off for three years. I was able to be in for a couple of months and out for a few weeks and in for a few weeks, out for a couple of months. So I could continue doing rock and roll and all the other things that I did. But also I had this lovely work that was um, really fantastic. And it is extraordinary how long uh, it has been popular. Um, as we all say, if we'd have known that people would still be watching it in 2020, we would have asked for a lot more money, but that's another story. So um, uh, after Prisoner, there were a few other, I, I've been involved in quite a lot of all female sorts of uh, shows. I was in Mum's the Word, Menopause the Musical. Uh, there was a show called Pack of Women, which was written by Robin Hart for a, about a year. Um, so I've had a kind of uh, unplanned, but in some ways, uh, very lucky career, right place, right time, right frock quite often, and that's what showbiz uh, generally is about. I also had the benefits of a university education. I, you know, I, I did it on a Commonwealth scholarship. It was before Gough Whitlam brought in free university education, um, and I had to do my matric twice. I repeated matric. You know what I'm saying when I say matric, uh, to get a Commonwealth scholarship. Um, so it's been an incredible career. So how did I come to be a writer as well? I'm just going to take a sip of water. Well, I'd always written um, in a kind of, I've never written short stories or those sorts of things, or, uh, and I certainly never thought I would, was going to launch straight into a novel, but I'd always kept a diary 
Um, I know that sounds ridiculous, um, but as Oscar Wilde said, it's great to keep a diary, to always have something fabulous to read on the train. I've got years of them. I may publish. Um, so I was used to expressing and my thoughts as a written word. I'd written some sketches when I was involved in the theatre groups. Uh, I'd written, certainly written some songs. And I, when I was in high school and even younger, I had written some poetry. So it was all kind of there. Um, but the first novel that I wrote was called Half Past Dead. I think I'd feature it over here. There it is, Half Past Dead. Um, it just grew out of a little exercise of mine, um, a kind of what if scenario where I would say, um, you know, what if such and such happened? And my what if was uh, about a woman who was married, who developed a crush on someone at work. And I'm not saying that that was, I don't say it was autobiographical. No, all right, I did have a crush on someone. Um, and I decided instead of actually doing anything about it, I'd write about it. So I wrote about this woman uh, and what would happen uh, if she went through with her fantasies or she tried to, you know, uh, see them through. And because at the time I was reading a lot of crime, I'm, you know, uh, as you can see, my shelves are full of, you know, P.D. James and Ruth Rendell and um, uh, all those people, Elizabeth George, um, you know, I, I was up to here with crime. I felt like um, someone had to die early on in the story and it might as well be the bloke. So <laughs> I started writing one night. My kids were probably um, about nine and five. They were still quite young, so hard working Mother's Day, you know what it's like. Um, and I sat and wrote, and the next day I realised I had 30 pages I'd written in longhand, and I thought, I might do something with this, and I continued to. I basically was entertaining myself. I just thought, how far can I take this? How, where will it go? What will happen? I started out with three characters. Um, it was her, the husband, and the guy she had the crush on. And then, of course, she had to go to work. She had to have a, a boss. The boss had a secretary. The husband had. So I was always moving forward but having to move back um, and making it up as I went along. So I didn't have a plan. I was just bowling along with the writing, entertaining myself. And um, I was in Mum's The Word at the time. We were touring and I was you know, just going back to the writing of it uh, every now and then. And I ended up showing about, I'd written about, I suppose, 20, 30,000 words. And I showed it to my best friend and she read it and she did, did me the enormous favour of saying to me, well, what happens next? Which is great, which meant that she was into the, the story and that gave me confidence to go on. But it took a long time to write it. I, um, you know, every time I'd pull it out and write something, I'd get another job. It was like this sort of good luck charm that um, I'd take out the novel, write a few bits and the phone would ring and I'd be off doing another job and I had a great run of work at the time. But that eventually, as it always does, ran out. And by then I told everyone I was writing this novel, so I had to bloody well finish it. Um, so I got into this routine of um, I didn't have a room in, like this in my house at the time where I could shut the door. So I'd go to the library. I went to the Mooney Valley Library up in Mooney Ponds. Every day I'd drop the kids at school and I'd go immediately to the library and, and put myself into one of those little carols and write till about 1 o'clock and then go home, do the laundry and all the other things one has to do, pick up the kids. And I kept doing that until I had finished the book to the point at which I wanted it to get. Uh, I told the story from A to Z the way I thought it should be. 
And it was a great feeling. It was a really fantastic feeling. I remember sitting in the car park outside the library and just going, wow, this is a great sense of satisfaction. Um, and I didn't even feel like I wanted, didn't need it to be published. Published. I, uh, I just felt really happy that I'd seen it through, that I'd finished the job. But that didn't last very long. And I did decide to send it off. And I, um, again, got lucky and sent it to um, my friend Shane Maloney, who's written a, a number of books of the Murray Whelan series. He's an old friend and um, he suggested his publishing company to have a chat to them. And they published the book, which was really fantastic. They published the second one. Uh, then they didn't like the third one, uh, which is pity. But by then I'd had an idea about um, writing. I didn't think it was going to be a memoir at the time because I, I, memoir wasn't really a genre at this stage. I thought I would just write a book that looked at where we called home. I decided I would go back and visit all of the houses I'd lived in around the world, all the ones during the army years, all the ones in Australia, the ones in Carlton and Fitzroy, the collective houses. And uh, I did. Um, I wrote it in about 2008 and it was published by Penguin in um, 2011 as the address book, which I don't think I've got on up here behind me. What an oversight on my part. Um, but yeah, it was a real look at where we call home. Uh, is it where we were born? Is it where we live now? Is it where our possessions are? Um, is it where our family is? Uh, it, it is a really, it was an interesting question and discussion. So I basically wrote everything I remembered about each address, all 32 of them. There were 32 addresses. Uh, what I remembered. And then when I got there, what happened when I got there? And um, it's a really interesting book and I'm really glad it's there because my um, my parents died very young. Uh, my mother died at 49 in 1975 and my father died uh, before her and he was 51 in 1970. So I've never been able to ask them all sorts of questions about our life and I, my children haven't had maternal grandparents and all those uh they're such a strong thing, that, that, that history. So I wanted my kids to have at least my version of what my history was to that point in time, not just a little collection of letters and envelopes uh, in a drawer somewhere and some photographs, which is very much all we've got from that time because, you know, things were different. Black and white photos with the crinkle cut edges or some slides. We didn't photograph every meal we eat like we do these days or every flower we look at. It was a different kind of time. Um, so that was the address book. Um, so uh, I, I should say to you at this I know some of you have already sent through some questions and I'm really happy to answer your questions uh, in the last 20 minutes or so um, from about 7.15. I've got some of them in advance. So I'm just scrolling through a whole lot of things that you might be uh, interested in. So uh, there were the three crime novels and the memoir. And uh, I'd already started working on, um, I should go, go back, going back a bit. Uh, when I was writing the address book, I applied to the Australia Council um, for a, a residency overseas so I could have a little base when I was visiting all those Northern Hemisphere um, addresses because it was going to be quite a complicated thing. And I ended up with a fellowship, um, a six-week fellowship in, in Ireland in, um, in uh, County Monaghan at a really fantastic writer's centre or residence called uh, Anna McCarrick, uh, the Tyrone Guthrie Centre. Um, and it's this beautiful old mansion on an old property that was donated by Sir Tyron Guthrie uh, to the arts in, in Ireland, but he had very strong links to Australia too, so every year there's allowance for 
two people to go and stay there from from Australia and it was invaluable time for me um, not only because it was just this fantastic place to write and really inspiring um, so there'd be 15 people in the house if it was full every week and uh, all that was required of us was that you know we could do what we did, did all day but we'd come down to dinner and sit around a big table at night and have a few drinks and discuss our lives and uh, in the first couple of weeks that I was staying there I was the only person writing um, this memoir everyone else was a poet there's a lot of poets in Ireland and uh, every, every week there was a large proportion of poets and playwrights. I mean, poetry is held in high regard in Ireland. And uh, I suppose that's what inspired me to get back into to writing that short form of poetry. Um, and I was surprised how much I enjoyed it and loved it. Um, and in 2018, um, for some reason that I will never really fully comprehend, I decided I'd write a poem a day as an exercise. And I did. Um, I wrote 365 poems that year. Uh, and it was a little bit like um, uh, writers always have to keep their practice up. Um, mostly people are writing their books or you know their non-fiction work or whatever but if you're not sometimes you're between but you need to keep that right those writing muscles going and a daily exercise of something is it's a bit like a tennis player going and hitting balls against a wall or you know going to the nets for a cricketer um to do that's the same for for writers and i really enjoyed the discipline of writing the poems every day and when they were finished, again, it's that thing of, um, well, I just go to office works and just print them out and give them to a few people. But I decided, um, or someone told me about a, a publisher who um, published only poetry and academic um, works. And she, Christine Mathieu of um, Little Fox Press, decided that she would publish it. And it came out as this book, A Day at a Time in Rhyme, um, which is available, as are all my books, um, on my website, janeclifton.com.au forward slash shop. That'll send you to all the links. Um, and it only comes as an actual book. It's not an e-book. So if you order it through that, it comes as a book. It's quite heavy. So I thought I'd read you a couple of poems tonight. Um, generally, I read from the other books, but I, um, I'm, I'm hoping that all of those books, will, my books, would be in your library. But if not, I'll um, check later and make sure that they're there. But in this weird time that we're living through at the moment of, um, I don't need to explain it to you. You're from Melbourne. We all know how it's uh, weird. And those of you who aren't, it's weird. Uh, and tonight's grand final eve, and I'm a, you know, I'm a footy tragic. Uh, even worse than that, I'm an Essendon football tragic. So bad year all round. Um, and it's so strange today with that weird holiday, and the grand final up in Queensland, and it's everything is skewed. It seems to me. Um, but in 2018, I, I did write a poem. Uh, uh, roundabout grand final and I thought as my tribute to the footy uh, I read it was actually September the 21st I wrote this in 2018 it's called finally young men at their peak smooth cheeked this day will not repeat this prime of life each muscle sleek and oiled caressed by experts a dozen options for the hair short long beard bun, Alice band and retro razor chic. The tattooed sleeve vaults through the air, aloft on faultless knees, crashing to the turf with ease, without a care, the hopes and dreams, the boos, the cheers of more than 90,000 fans are ringing in your ears. The taunts, the jeers, hearts pumping, ready for the fray. The skinny seconds tick away like time bombs, flying feet and godlike feats of supernatural strength, 
bursts of speed, turnovers on a zack, rebounding from the pack like Coca-Cola yo-yos. The siren and the tears, the sporting handshakes while the body reappears and every knock and hit lines up to say good day to you. Uru. But you knew immortality for just an hour or two. Ah, those lovely young men. So, uh, again, uh, once I'd finished doing the poems that year and, and got the book out, which was a really fantastic sense of achievement, I sort of went off the boil a little bit the following year. It was like an elastic band going, ba-doing, you know. But it picked up again. And once um, the COVID kind of struck, um, it seemed to me... Uh, I just had to express somehow what we what we were all feeling, what I was feeling it, and connect to a whole lot of people. And so, um, at the beginning of uh, of of when the the pandemic struck, I wrote this poem in April. Of course, she's dreaming. Last night I had the strangest dream. I dreamt the world had come full stop. Caught us on the hop, it did, right when we were doing something pressing, uncalled for, instant reassessing of the meaning of it all. Could we have one second more, we cried. The door slammed shut on what was once the wide arc of existence, on all of our petitions. No excuses, no exemptions, the world replied. You are in it for the haul, the long, the short, the chubby and the tall on this strange ride. Like magic, planes fell out of the sky, traffic disappeared and all was ghostly silent, scared, incomprehensible and weird. I woke to sunlight streaming through the blinds and birdies singing high and wild, woke to find the dream was real, like yesterday and the day before, but this time not so chilling. The world still turns, a child still learns, and love will find a way to something new and thrilling. Yeah. So, yeah, and then when the curfew struck, I'm just checking my time here so that everything's all right. When the curfew struck, I got back into that groove of um, doing the daily and I committed to um, write a poem a day for the length of the curfew. And... That was only going to be uh, 40 days, <laughs> 42 days, in fact. It was going to be um, six weeks, but it spun out to 56. Um, so <laughs> I know we all probably felt, I can't tell you the number of times I've thought I've had the had COVID. Um, if I went and had myself checked for every time I thought I had it, I probably would have had a frequent flyer card. I would have been up there every day. Um, and this little poem, I hope, is a, a funny look at that that may resonate with you. I wrote this on August the 7th, which was day five of uh, being locked in. I just sneezed. Is that it? No. Some dust. I really have to blow my nose. Is that it? No. A bit teary, lacrimose. I feel too hot. I feel too cold. I feel lethally bloody old. Is that it? No. My head is splitting. They say you get a headache, then you die. Is this it? No. Several times a day or more, I feel it, think I have it, the unmentionable, that somehow it has breached my lockdown door and mask as if it's gunning just for me, lurking like a triffid there behind my lemon tree, skulking up my driveway, seeking out my juicy, dried-up boomer DNA, as if by mere imagining it will find me through the night air, the miasma, infect me in my midnight bed, when in my pounding heart I know. It's just that last half bottle of red, the onions, garlic, chocolate. No, it's just my head talking bad things up a lot. Living in a COVID state of fear can be as harmful to one's health as cigarettes and beer. We've all been through the ups and downs of it. I, I reckon, you know, it's it's such a roller coaster ride. Um, and it's so far from over yet. Uh, it's um, it's ongoing. And then there was a, you know, as we're gradually 
emerging little by little hopefully on Sunday it'll be um, even more fantastic this will be just such a seminal experience for us all and uh, and um, with that in mind I'm, this is the last one I'll read to you I promise indulge me this is the last one but I wrote this on August the 30th day 28 of the curfew all the generations who missed out on war from boomers through the XYZ, millennials and more, those obsessed with reenactments, Anzac Cove and Nazis, graveside tours, Kokoda Trail, Kamikaze, those who yearn to feel what it was really like for dad and grandpa gone before, in search of meaning, ghost connections to worldwide vintage strife, rationing, gas masks and conscription, trenches, mateship, sacrifice, as if war was something past and finite, done and dusted. Yeah, right. But this is your moment. You are there in this great pandemic global scare, a war of wars more lethal than any battle waged before pitched against a mighty foe who ripped the planes out of the sky, who shut the shops despite our cries, who smashed the markets, and what's more, forced every living soul inside. You faced a warrior with no country, no allegiance, no mercy, no craven idol, and no Jesus. Mum and Dad, what did you do in the COVID wars? I whacked on a mask and kept indoors. <laughs> let's hope it's all over soon now um i've got a couple of questions from you i'm going to check and see whether there's any that's come in on my little message you can it'll come through apparently um on the messages but i'll see if that comes through but in the meantime uh i've got some questions um this one is from andrew hello andrew um, who asked if my varied interests, um, of course, I, I am a marriage celebrant as well. And of course, that's gone very quiet. Um, I used to have a, quite a, you know, healthy business as a marriage celebrant and also as a celebrant with funerals and uh, naming days. And that's gone very quiet. Hopefully that'll all kick back into action. Are my varied interests... Um, uh, do do they complement each other? Not do they complement each other and um, not stopped? There's no door closes. Um, uh, how they all interact and uh, that's the main question, uh, Andrew. I think the strongest part of my um, creative life has been as a storyteller. Um, even when I'm singing a song. Uh, I'm usually I'm very into the words of songs. I'm I'm not an oobly doobly scat singer. Um, after rock and roll, of course, I sang jazz for many years and still do. Um, but I like to tell the story in the song. Uh, it usually has a point or a character, uh, and it's it's the same kind of energy and approach that I bring to performing a song that I do to acting. Um, taking on a character, uh, writing. Uh, the beautiful thing about writing, of course, is, um, and I'm often asked this, you know, um, writing is such a solitary business, sit in your room all day uh, without an audience, um, of, you know, which do you prefer? Uh, and I love them both. I mean, I love being on stage with, uh, you know, a thousand people or 10 people or 20 or a couple of people I have a regular during normal times I have a regular gig down at um, uh, Claypot's Evening Star which is a seafood restaurant in South Melbourne on a Thursday night I'm there and you know mostly people are eating but occasionally they look up and I don't mind that it's a great interaction but I do like performing and getting that instant feedback like I would love to be in a a room with all of you tonight to be able to see your faces and be able to gauge the room a little. Um, but writing is just great because, you know, you sit with your pen and you decide who lives and dies. You decide what people are wearing, uh, how they speak, where they walk, how they talk. You're not beholden to anybody else. 
you know, you can write a whole storyline to go, oh, no, better not do that. Remove that child, remove that marriage. You can go back. You get all these chat. You get to play God, and uh, that's very exciting. So, again, it's storytelling. And with the poems, it's it, it's the same kind of thing. It's um, uh, I am trying to sum up and condense a thought into um, into something really concentrated to it. it doesn't have the big range of of a novel and it doesn't and again poetry why not write songs um and it is different in with a song you've got you know verse verse middle eight chorus repetition um and that's a whole different thing whereas in poetry you've got Mine is kind of a free-forming thing, but it has got rhythm in it. It's not rhyming couplets. Sometimes it is, but there's always rhythm in it. But I like the idea of condensing something down to uh, a single thought or a single idea that express, you know, a single idea that expresses a universal thought. So, yes, they all inform each other. I, I have to say... Um, in my work as a marriage celebrant, as a celebrant in general, it's just been the most, what an absolute um, goldmine of stories because you as a celebrant are there at the crucial moments of people's lives, their celebrations, uh, births, deaths and marriages, you know, uh, and there's the joy of, of, of the wedding and all the inherent dramas of you know, the different families. I love watching all of that. Uh, and at a funeral, you know, you're, you're there to help people through the most difficult of times um, and get some kind of meaning and, and um, significance uh, to the moment. I, harking back again to my parents because they died so young, and it was different times. I, even though I was 20 and 26 when they died, I was not involved really in their funerals at all. And oh, I just really regret that. And now I'm really happy to be able to involve even younger family members in a small way that they remember how they pay tribute to their grandmother or their auntie or uncle or whatever. Um, so it's a great, great moment. I did toy with the idea of um writing a kind of book about my life as a celebrant because uh, i've been doing it for 10 years i've probably married about 350 couples and sent off quite a few people but i don't want to name people i think that's a real uh, that's a real contract between you and your clients you don't their, st their stories are safe with you and uh I'd love to be able to share them, but I couldn't find a convenient way to do it that didn't betray that trust in some way. Um, so I stayed away from that. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question, Andrew. Uh, I've got a lovely shout out here from Marianne Sischler, who was uh, who is a teacher who taught both my children um, at uh, Ascot Vale Primary School and also taught my nephew over in Caulfield. So she's had a big connection with my family and you'll be thrilled to know, Marianne, if you are watching, that, yes, we remember you very dearly. And um, Molly is my daughter, Molly Rose, who's teaching in London at the moment. She's been there for three years and uh, she wants to let you know that you, you did a marvellous job because she's a teacher <laughs> and she's a very good teacher too. So, um, you know, we if there's anything that... Uh, are we taking out so much from this crisis that we're in at the moment, but the value that we place on the really important workers in our world, the, the medical people at the front line, the nurses, the doctors, uh, all of those, the orderlies, everyone, the people testing, uh, just absolute, you know, if you're on your deathbed, are you going to call for a CEO or are you going to call for a nurse? They're the ones that should be being paid enormous amounts of money. Um, the police have been amazing. All of those people have been fantastic. But the teachers, any parent who's been homeschooling 
the last few months knows the value of their teachers uh, even more so than they ever did before. And I think even students have a renewed appreciation of the value of teachers in their lives and in society. So um, can't value them highly enough. Um, what else? Oh, yes, I have have talked a little bit about Gibraltar, Maureen. There's a, there was a question about Gibraltar. Um, and it is a weird place to be born, I've got to say. I've been back a few times now as a, as a, when I was writing the book. It was the first time I'd been back for a while, but, oh, it's so strange. It's a, a very strange place to be born. It's also a very beautiful place to be born. Um, it's this strange mixture of... British and Spanish and Gibraltarians who live there. And then there's the crazy macaque monkeys, the apes of Gibraltar up the top. They say if the ape, when the apes leave Gibraltar, it'll be the end of the British Empire. <laughs> Got a hot flash for those apes and for the rest of us. Um, it is a strange place, but I, I, I kind of love the quirkiness of having been born on a rock. I always I'd say at the beginning of uh, the address, born on a rock, I was born to rock. You know, there's a line for you. Um, yes, I was. I wasn't actually. You asked me about being raised a Catholic. Um, I had the weird experience of being brought up Church of England first, and then my mother, who was a Catholic but was in a mixed marriage, she married a non-Catholic, and that was a big deal in 1943 in India. Um, British Raj over there. Uh, remembered that she was supposed to bring us all up, so bring us all up Catholic. So at the age of seven, I was rebaptized and confirmed, and I took to Catholicism like a duck to water. I really liked it. It was great. They had all the best, had the best theatre, you know, and I loved, I did love the Latin. I loved singing in the choir. That was one of the great training grounds for me as a singer was singing the Latin Mass and the Easter Mass, it was just all beautiful. But it did change, um, you know, with whatever it is, Vatican XII, uh, when it changed to English. It was all a bit, I don't know. It was, um, I'd started reading Camus and Sartre by then. So uh, I, I am culturally a Catholic. That's my cultural background, very strongly. I've got, you know, statues of Mary and Joseph and rosary beads hanging from every corner of my room, but um, I'm not a practising Catholic. There, I've said it. <laughs> um, I'm just going to check and see if there's anything's come through the texts or oh, no, maybe I'm supposed to look at YouTube. I'll go and have a look at that and see if there's any messages come through. I don't think so. Anyway, Cheryl, if you're watching, if there's something I need to know, send me a text. Um, but uh, there's obviously some questions about, um, a long question from Karen about um, prisoner. I think I've sort of covered it a bit. Um, but I'll, she has three questions at the end of her long question. Um, how does someone get to meet you face to face, Jane? Well, you just got to come to a gig. So Thursday nights at Clay Pots in, uh, in South Melbourne. Um, I've never been a big person with sending, uh, you know, autograph photos of myself or something. I like to have the exchange with someone or, you know, um, seeing someone so um, I'm usually pretty good with people although I do have my bad days get a bit tetchy but I'm you know I'm in my surroundings so you know I'm allowed to be a bit tetchy I don't know how many episodes I was in in prison but I, as I say I was in it on and off for um uh three years but there are a huge number of websites who know so much about that show. they know more about that show than someone reading Hansard uh, they they know, you know. See, like I've, I I have done some events in um, in Britain, run by um, Screen Star events, and you know people will come and they've got all these questions. I have no idea who they're talking about, and they will they will have an intimate knowledge of every character. They're people who have watched that show more times than it got shown. So um, it is, it's a bit like being at a weird trivia night because I just don't, I can't remember storylines, but they do. Uh, and 
Karen's last question was, why did I decide to leave Prisoner? Uh, well, I'd, I just made a record with Joe Camilleri of Jojo Zap and the Falcons. We recorded a track called Taxi Mary, which was a top 10 hit in Australia. And um, he was going off on tour and he asked me if I'd like to come along. And I jumped on that tour bus and toured around Australia for six months and had the greatest time. And you know, I suppose uh, I did come back for maybe a couple of episodes the following year in about 1983, but I was off doing other things, I think. And, um, yeah, I probably shouldn't have left. It was regular money, just really like Everyone loves a regular job. I know that shouldn't be uh, the way you are. Oh, here we go. Look at this. Um, it's a nullable trip. Oh, what do I remember about the Nullarbor trip? Well, I remember a lot because, you know, I was crying for a lot of it and I was 15, 16 actually. And um, my dad, uh, God love him, uh, had this fantastic car uh, which he brought out to England, uh, brought out to Australia from England when we, we, we emigrated. It was, it was the first car he'd ever owned because in the army you just don't own cars. You have a staff car or whatever or don't own a house, you don't own crockery or blankets or cutlery. You just move into your next billet and the quartermaster comes along and ticks off, you know, sheets, white, seven, cups gray eight you know at the end you've got to tick them all off again so when we left the army and he'd been in the army since he was a boy soldier he, he enlisted when he was 14 years and six months old and his dad signed him in and he'd been a soldier all of his working life and when we retired he was only 40 you know and uh, bought a house and he bought this fantastic car. And it was, um, you remember the series Z cars were about uh, Zephyrs? Well, his was a Zodiac. <laughs> it was a Zodiac station wagon. And uh, the back had a back, it was built by Rolls Royce. So it had a little Rolls Royce badge on it. It was two-tone blue. And, you know, I dream about that car a lot. And um, in, uh, oh, I'll have to think about it. It was a television show I was in earlier uh, a couple of years ago and they used a very similar car and I got very emotional when I saw it. So the point of that story is that when we uh, came across to Melbourne from Perth, we drove, but we caught, we drove up to Kalgoorlie and put the car on the train and then we met up with the car again in Port Pirie in Adelaide and drove the rest of the way. So um, I've been back a couple of times on the train uh, across Nanalabor and it's it is fabulous and spectacular it's a bit claustrophobic because they've got air conditioning on the whole time and the air's not it's like a very long plane trip but um, I would love to do that trip by car now that the road is sealed and uh, last year I was uh, on tour with a play called Spencer uh, which is this brilliant play um, uh, and uh, written by Katie Warner and I played a mum of two footballers it was a real stretch and a daughter and uh, it was hilarious great great show and we went on tour last year and we went all the way down to Esperance and Albany in WA this is and up north to Caratha and Geraldton and we went up to Townsville it was just the most brilliant trip and I loved going back to WA is still a part of me that's very much uh, attached to the Indian Ocean so hopefully uh, and my partner is really keen um, to do a trip to WA so um, hopefully we'll do that. Um, what was it like to work for Hector Crawford? Well I never really got to meet him uh, but Crawford's was fantastic in the way they looked after their actors. Um, they notoriously, uh, not notoriously, famously paid a lot better than Grundy's did. Um, they looked after, it was a real family of people who worked for Hector Crawford and, and for all Henry Crawford. I, I, when I did my audition at Crawford's, it was for Henry Crawford. And um, he was a really lovely person, but they were, I was never a regular actor on any of their shows. I was just a guest. Uh, I think my first role was playing a hippie in Division 4. It was 1970. 
and you, you had to provide your own costume in those days and and I spoke the costume person rang me up and I said well you know what do you would you want me to you know some crochet or some you know beads or feathers should have you got a pair of jeans <laughs> that was what was radical and hippie in 1970 on television I said yes I've got I've got a pair of jeans I'll wear them but no they were really fantastic um, a fantastic organisation. What a family. They really changed, the, you know, all the people who got gigs in Crawford television productions have gone, um, nearly all of them went on to have um, uh, jobs in the burgeoning film uh, industry that was happening. A lot of it was in Sydney, I have, with all due respect. Um, but everyone got their kind of training doing TV4 and, and homicide, like the way kids get their training in Neighbours and Home and Away now. Um, but, you know, a big range of types. So, you know, he was, they should have knighted him. <laughs> you know what I mean by that. Um, that's all I've got from you, Cheryl. Let me see if there's any, oh, look, there's a picture. Oh, that means, uh, here it comes. What high school in Burwood did I go to? Oh, I went to Burwood High. I went to Burwood High. I arrived there in uh, 1965 in the middle of the leaving year. And um, actually when I was writing the book, I went back to try and find it. And there's still some of the classrooms. It's now Deakin uh, Campus out there on Burwood Highway, um, opposite where the Skyline Drive used to be on uh, on that road, on the highway. Um, and there's still some old classrooms there and I got quite nostalgic, hemmed in a bit they are by all of Deakin. But yeah, went to Burwood High. That was when my first rock and roll band happened in the geography room at Burwood High. We did three days in a row. We were called The Bulk and uh, we rocked We rocked the place. It was really good. Um, I've done that. Yeah, I reckon... Uh, Monica, Mercedes, thank you. Um, the book about the celebrant, you know, if I can find a way to do it, I probably have to fictionalise it, I think, you know, just to make sure everybody was, um, no one felt like I was using this story in a bad way, you know, because um, some of them are absolutely hilarious and some of them are heart-rending. Um, it, you know, it's a truly fabulous job. Um, I'm, I'm Sadly, there's 50 million people doing it now, so there's not as much work as there was. But, um, uh, yeah, there's got to be a way to. I did, you know, when I first th thought about being a marriage celebrant, it was because uh, my son had a friend whose dad was a celebrant and my first thought was, what a great idea for a sitcom, a whole bunch of celebrants sitting around talking about what they've been doing that day. And literally, like, two weeks later, there was an ad in the paper to do the course at Victoria University uh, to become a celebrant. And I had just about enough money to do it then, and I thought, forget about the miniseries. I'm actually going to do the job. And I never looked back from it. It was uh, it's just been a, a great um great thing to do. And, you know, it's, <laughs> I'd say, it, it's one of the jobs one of the only jobs I've had that uses all the skills I've got of public speaking, of writing, of getting on with people, but people actually want them. They want those skills instead of, you know, the hit and miss thing of show business. This is actually skills that people kind of need. Okay, now I'm going to make sure, oh, look, we've got a couple of minutes left. So, look, thank you so much for your company. Um, you can uh, visit my website www.janeclifton.com.au um, if you want I'm still publishing quite a lot of poetry so you just forward slash blog will find those poems um, if you want to get any of the books um, they're in the shop section of that um, of that uh, website um, on Instagram you can follow me on Twitter at Miss Jane Clifton all lower case, or you can follow me on Instagram at cliffo2, like C L I double F O T double O, cliffo2. Um, I post lots of pictures of flowers, but not a lot of pictures of food. Find that very dull. 
Um, thank you so much for your company. I hope next time um, I get to talk to you will be uh, in person out at Glen Ira. There's a book coming out about Labassa, which is right in the middle of the Glen Ira area where I lived in the 70s. So look out for that. I've got a chapter in there. I've got a chapter in every book. That's not true. Um, I'm going to go and have some red wine now and apparently my partner is making chops. So I'm saying goodbye to you. Uh, if you do have any other questions, please feel free to, you know, private message me or something through the, the website or through Cheryl and she'll send it on to me. But thanks once again. I'm saying bye-bye now. <laughs>